All right, good morning, AP Physics. Uh, we are right after our chapter two through four tests. It's our first day of notes. Um, so when we Zoom later today, I think that that probably will be pertaining to the, the test. But also I thought maybe some of the demonstrations of today's notes would be better if we save them for the Zoom because then we can do it where it's live and not set up like, you know, where like if there was a mistake that I just re do the video or that kind of stuff. So we'll save some of that too. So that's, I think, our plan for today. Uh, <clears throat> today, we're going to do the notes for chapter 5.1 and for 5.2, uh, starting Newton's laws. Very important uh, chapter for sure. Um, obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, uh, Newton's laws obviously are a big part of, of uh, classical physics, but really Newton's second law is probably the most important equation in all of physics. So that's what we have coming up today. So um, hopefully you had a good weekend. I'm assuming I've graded the tests by the time we do this, but we'll see. Yours might be difficult to do, but as of right now, I think I will get them done. So um, our first section here with, uh, of chapter five, dealing with Newton's laws. This is a chapter about force. So kind of the, the theme that's going on here. And what we have in the second picture is a half pipe that's just a little bit wider than the first picture. Not sure why the entire picture didn't show up there. And that's what I have sitting on a table right now. And then of course in the Zoom, we'll do some other Newton's first law uh, demonstrations for you as well. So Galileo really is the person who gets this started. Newton's first law is where it's kind of formally explained. Newton kind of more formally explains everything. Galileo, uh, earlier time period, uh, more difficult time period, uh, dealing with the uh, Roman Catholic Church in Italy and things like that. So Galileo kind of had to do some of his science in secrecy and, and had to explain himself a lot, whereas Newton in England didn't have those issues. Um, but a lot of it had to do with the time period. So the first thing starts off with, this is what Galileo's thought process was. If you put a ball onto a half pipe, right, and you release the ball, if there's no friction, the ball should roll up to the height of my hand on this side, and then roll back down and roll back up to my hand on this side, and go back and forth to the same height forever and ever. Of course, we see that right away the ball doesn't go to the same height, so therefore we know there's friction, and in fact, when we get into the second half of chapter five, I think in order for us to do a friction lab, we'll probably use this you know what, I take that back. It probably won't be until we get to conservation of energy that we'll use this as our way to show um, energy loss with uh, because of the friction. So never mind. We'll do a different friction lab when we get to the first half of chapter five. No, second half of chapter five. Um, anyway, with no friction, the ball rolls to the same height. So Galileo said that even if we make the half pipe wider, like the second picture, same thing would happen. So then the question was, for Galileo, what would happen if instead we just had a quarter pipe and the ball was able to roll off of the first side, when would it stop rolling? Okay. So the idea was if there was no friction, that ball would roll forever. So we have the idea here that um, something that has a motion, if there's no net force acting on it, will continue with that motion forever and ever and ever. And that becomes Newton's first law. But Galileo kind of discussed it in terms of inertia, that that tennis ball, when it's sitting on the, on, just on the counter like normal, that it's not going to do anything uh, because it has a laziness. And the Latin word for laziness was something like something uh, related to inertia. So that's where this idea came about. And then, like I said, Newton kind of formalized it with this whole idea that it's Inertia could also be in the fact that if it's doing something, that it's going to keep doing that unless a net force acts on it. <clears throat> okay, uh, what we'll do for net uh, for Newton's first law is look at situations where there's no net force acting on an object. So, so we'll show like how there's cancellation of those forces. Um, and that's also what your first lab for chapter five is going to be. Newton's second law is the most important formula in all of physics. It says that a net force causes a mass to accelerate. And it's a nice, easy equation, isn't it? Uh, when we get to this point in the equation, it's easy stuff. The hard part is what goes in for F net. Um, in complicated situations, 
how do we determine exactly what the net force is? So we'll start today by looking at place, looking at situations where there's no net force, and then we'll build to the second half of today where there is a net force. Newton's third law is the one that you probably are most familiar with, which is to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Technically, we should say for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. That force always comes in. Now I put it on these slides as opposite or comes in pairs, but um, better textbooks uh, usually refer to them as forces always come in interaction pairs. That two things are interacting with each other. Okay. So what I have here is a couple pictures. Um, first picture, if you were to uh, put somebody, I mean, obviously we're all standing or sitting on the surface of the earth. Okay. If they were standing on a bathroom scale, we would say that that bathroom scale reads what their weight is. All right. So what's happening is the earth, so we're going to use the blue arrow to represent the earth is pulling down force of the earth, pulling down on the person. Okay. There's got to be a interaction to that force. The interaction to that force would be that the person pulls up on the earth. We'll just abbreviate it. Person pulling up on the earth. So is it the earth pull, holds you in space or is it that you hold the earth in space? Right? That's the whole idea with the interaction pair. And the answer to that is both. Okay? They're both contributing to that, um, to that interaction pair. Um, if you were to go skydiving, if you were to jump off of something, we, did, we studied free fall in the last chapter. We know that the reason why you accelerate towards the earth is because there's that force of the earth pulling down on the person. But equal and opposite is the fact that the earth is moving upward, is accelerating upward because of the force of the person acting on it. So both things are occurring at the same time. Now, obviously, we I think we know that the uh, acceleration of the earth isn't going to be very much. Um, it's going to be so negligible that even compared to the size of an atom, it's a small number. But technically, it's there. So these two forces are equal and opposite to each other. So that's Newton's third law. And I think we talk more about that either at the end of these notes or at the end of the next day's notes. Um, just some just definition style stuff that we have here. You know, the definition of a force. I mean, look at how elementary that definition sounds, a push or a pull. Uh, the idea that really all a force is is just something that causes an object, causes a mass to get moving or stop moving or move in a different direction. Um, there are four fundamental forces. Really, there's just three because the weak nuclear force has been tied to the electromagnetic force. But these are the forces that we really we know of. We know of gravitational force and attraction between matter. We'll study more about that in chapter six. Electromagnetic force, we study a little bit of electricity second semester, but we really don't get into the force as much, a little bit. And then obviously uh, nuclear forces, we don't really get into that, but the strong nuclear force is basically just describing what holds a nucleus together. Why would a bunch of protons want to hang out together inside of a nucleus so close to each other? We know there's tremendous density there. Those protons should, should repel each other and explode a nucleus apart. So there must be some binding glue it holds the nucleus together, and that's the strong nuclear force. A lot of times, the force of gravity, when we're talking about uh, an object in this chapter, we might just call it the object's weight. So we'll primarily use F sub G as the symbol for gravity. Mostly I use that because that's how I was trained. I think the textbook that I'm getting most of the information out of puts it as F sub W for the force of gravity. Um, I remember some textbook somewhere where they always just refer to it as M times G instead of writing it as FG. Notice this is a subscript G, meaning telling us what kind of force it is. This is the acceleration of gravity. That 9.8 we learned last chapter that this is, you know, a multiplication of things that equals FG, but they don't put brackets around it like that. Okay, so just be aware that there's different ways that we can name our, uh, and you know what, even some textbooks just use a capital W. For the weight for the object's weight so there's different ways to name it we primarily use fg so does the ap test um and then a net force what happens when we take force which is a vector and we add all the different forces together we might end up with the fact that the forces uh vectorally give us a net direction of movement 
All right, so using the first law would be to try to describe situations where an object is not moving. So what is our object in this problem? We could say it's the elephant, but I think a better choice for us is this little ring right here. Okay, so let's say that we have three ropes attached to a real sturdy metal ring, and there's an obstinate elephant that wants to go this way. Maybe that's where the, the hay is, right? It wants to go over there and eat. And then we've got two circus clowns that are holding on to this uh, elephant, and they happen to be pulling perpendicular to each other. So we want to know, um, I don't know, maybe the question would be better written as what kind of force is the elephant exerting such that all three of these forces cancel out to give us no net movement of that ring. The reason I like it described this way is because this is how your first lab of this chapter is. Um, give me a moment here while I look at the calendar. I always keep one handy for you. Um, this lab is going to be uh, assigned to you tomorrow. So I bet you all have better description with that lab as to exactly what you're going to do, because I don't have a picture of it right here in these notes uh, to describe it. But basically, you're going to be looking at, a, uh, at, at three forces. And actually, you're going to be given two of them. And then you've got to tell me what the third force is that cancels the other two out. Don't expect them to be nice and, and perpendicular to each other. Don't expect them to fall perfectly on like the X and Y axes. I would expect any uh, angle and any values could be given such that we could have three forces that cancel out. And then you're going to solve for this one here. We'll just put F question mark. Okay. So in order to figure out that force, maybe we should take these two forces and see how they add together. So we could say that graphically, we know that graphically that forces add together head to tail. So that's supposed to be a Y there. It's not coming out very good. So my first force, F1, is a vector that looks a little bit like this. Point straight up, about that long. Kind of straight up. And then my second vector, F2, head to tail, sticks out about that far. Eh, that's not straight or perpendicular. That looks a little better. And therefore, my resulting force of those two would go from here to here. All right, that's how we would have done this last chapter. That would be the resulting force. That's the F net of the two clowns that cancels out the force of the elephant. But what if in our lab tomorrow, instead we say that the force of the elephant points from here to here, such that in the end, when you're all done, now don't write this on your notes if you're copying this, right here, that right there tells us that there's no net force acting on that ring because those three forces add together graphically to give us no no net, you know, no resulting force vector pointing in any direction. They all cancel each other out. So what are the values that make this work? Graphically, if this is a 300 Newton force and this is a 400 Newton force and they're perpendicular to each other, then we could say that this one here is kind of like the hypotenuse. And we could say that F net for the clowns equals Pythag, 300 squared plus 400 squared equals 500 newtons. So those two clowns, their forces together add up to equal 500 newtons this way, which is perfectly parallel to the force of the elephant, 500 newtons the other way. How do we know that? Because that ring's not moving, okay? So um, that was an easy one because we didn't have to do anything with the vector components because of the falling on the X and Y axes and being perpendicular to each other. If they aren't like that, what if instead we see a problem like this where the, a couple of the forces fall into some of the quadrants? Then we have to break them up into their components, all right? So we want to know what is the net force acting on the ring. Once again, the ring didn't really show up, but there's a little ring right here in the middle. And uh, we want to know what happens to it. If there's a net force, it moves in that direction, accelerates in that direction. But if there's no net force, then it's either not moving or it's already moving at a constant speed and it keeps doing that. Let's not say that today. Let's say today that if there's no net force acting on it, it's just not moving. Okay, so I start with vector F1, force F1. It has two components. It has the component that goes this way, we'll call this F1X. And it has the component that goes this way, we'll call that one F1Y. All right, so F1X is equal to, so now you know how to do this from last chapter. 
If not, just a quick little reminder, I'm going to erase some of this so it doesn't get in our way, is that if you took vector F1Y and moved it over here, you'd make a right triangle. So therefore, we can use right triangle trigonometry, sine and cosine, in order to figure out what F1 and F2, F1Y and F1X are. Let me get rid of that so it's not clouding up our picture. Okay, so F1X is equal to F times, no, 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 no. See how I defaulted to X always being cosine? That's not true this time. This time, because the 45 degree angle comes off of here, really, I should have moved F1X up to the top of this and made the triangle up here instead. So that means that F1X is the side opposite the angle. So F1 times sine theta is how I get its value. Now, it wouldn't matter with a 45 degree angle because it's the same value, but it will matter for the 30. So 500 times sine of 45. See, I am wrote backward here, but see what I did is I actually changed the angle. So for those of you who just follow the slides, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now because you're just looking at the slides. I just changed the angles instead of being 30 and 45. I just used their complements instead and did it that way. But I already started a thought, so I'm going to stay with my thought here. And that is this comes out to be 353.6 newtons. And then F1Y is equal to F1 times cosine because now it's the side adjacent to the reference angle. And that equals the same thing, though, because it's a 45 degree angle. 45 also 353.6 okay then i'll do the same thing for f2 f2 is a 707 newton force at a 30 degree angle so i break it up into its x and y components the f2y is the side adjacent to the angle so it gets the cosine and the f2x is the side uh, opposite if you were to move it up to the top of that triangle i hope that all makes sense because it has to make sense or else you, well, I mean, what's the worst case scenario? You get the angles backward, you get some answers wrong. It's not the end of the world, but we certainly want as many right answers as we can. So F2 times sine of 30 degrees is equal to 707 times sine of 30. Half of 707 is, oh my gosh, 353.6. Only not 353.6, it's not negative 353.6 because it's along the negative x-axis, right? Our reference angle is an acute angle. Your cal calculator doesn't know where the angle's at. It just knows how to solve for 30 degrees. So you have to know where your angle's at based on the picture, okay? So that's negative 353. And then F2y is equal to F2 times cosine theta, 707 times a side adjacent, so cosine of 30, and that equals 612.3. Positive because it's upward, so the positive y-axis. Okay, then vector F3, I know we really wouldn't look at it as having components, but we can talk about it. Its x component and its y component would be like saying F3 times... Uh, Okay, so what angle would we use here? I mean, we're using 90 degrees or we're using zero degrees. How about if instead we just don't even write any of that because we're all smart enough to recognize conceptually it has no X component. And its Y component is what its value is because it points straight down on the Y axis. And I'll give it a negative sign there because it points straight down. Okay, remind you a little bit of those problems from chapter Two or three, I think it was chapter three where we had to do the X and Y components. All right, so now in order to solve what the uh, net force is, we need to take three X components, this one, this one, and this one, and add them together. So F1X plus F2X plus F3X. We'll call this the F net in the X direction. That's what I want you to call it on your lab. And that's equal to positive 353.6 plus negative 353.6 plus zero equals zero newtons. F net in the y direction, F net in the y direction equals these three components, which equals F1y plus F2y plus F3y, which equals 
I already forgot. Oh, they're the same number. So 353.6 plus 612.3 plus negative 966 adds up pretty close to zero newtons. A little bit, little bit of rounding there with zero newtons. So what that tells us then is the actual F net, which is equal to the Pythag of the X net and the Y net, just in case we would have one, comes out to be zero. So no net movement of that ring because all the forces canceled out. Uh, I know I went over those quickly, um, but you're smart people. You can handle this. Uh, this is exactly what your lab looks like because you're going to be finding those components. So I would just say that when your lab is all done, you should have all of these parts to it, and including you should also have the graphical method, how I showed you to solve this part here too, where you actually draw the vectors out. So I'll explain that better with the lab, but in the end, that picture and this picture of all your work will get you full credit. Okay, good. All right. Newton's second law, um, well, it's really, this is just looking at mass versus weight for Newton's second law. Uh, there's a lot more to Newton's second law than this. If you jump out of an airplane, then we can say that your F net is your FG, okay? And so F net equals mass times acceleration, which equals mass times gravity. That's the definition of weight is mass times gravity. So if you want to know what your acceleration is, it's 9.8, as we expect. But when you're standing on the Earth's surface, it's hard for us to describe it that way, because to say F net equals M times A, technically F net equals zero. Okay, this is where Newton's third law comes into play, is why is the F net equal to zero? Well, let's look at what forces are acting on just the person right now. The Earth is pulling down on the person. Force of the Earth acting on the person, better known as FG, gravity. Okay, now equal and opposite to that force, I'm going to erase this in a second. So if you're copying these down, just be ready that you might not want that clouding up your picture. This is the force of the person pulling up on the earth. That's not why the person doesn't move, because those two forces are not acting on one object. They're acting on two different objects that are interacting. They're why if they're not touching each other, the person up high free falls down towards the earth down low. I mean, if you were to go skydiving on an asteroid, you might actually see the asteroid move upward while you go downward towards it, okay? So both things would be moving towards each other. So how do we get net movement if forces are canceling out? We look at just the forces acting on just one object. So if you want to talk about what forces are acting on the person right now, the red one's not acting on the person. Person, It's canceling out the force of the Earth acting on the person. The force that's also acting on the person is the Earth pushing up on you, okay? I know, it's crazy. What cancels out the force of the earth on the person is the force of the earth on the person. When you stand on the earth, the earth is pulling down on you because matter attracts matter. But when you stand on the earth, electrically, the electrons that are in the surface of the earth uh, repel the electrons in the surface of your feet and make a little barrier there that keeps you from falling into the earth. So while the earth is pulling down on you, at this point, once you're touching the earth, you're not really touching it, are you? Nothing really touches anything. Everything is separated by electrostatic repulsion because of the electrons. The earth pushes back up on you. So how do we differentiate between those two in this class? Well, we're gonna give them different names. And if you wanna write all this stuff down in your notes, it's a good idea because these are things that you're gonna care about. We call this force acting on the person FG. So we can say that it's equal to mass times gravity, even though there isn't acceleration because the net force on the person is zero. When you free fall, the net force equal, is equal to just that one force, you're, you're gonna accelerate. But when you're standing on the Earth's surface, you have what's called the normal force canceling out the gravitational force on the person. The Earth's own attraction cancels out by its repulsion. The Earth's supposed to attract it to you, and re repulsed by you. It's kind of like Mary. I'm just kidding. All right. Forces that balance out gravity on level ground is referred to as normal force. Okay, good. I did mention it right here. So I thought I was getting ahead of myself. Fn. Make sure that you recognize that Fn is not F net. Double exclamation point. 
Okay, those two things are different just because one, well, just because both of them have an N in there, one of them is talking about the net force, the other one's talking about the normal force. They're different things. Okay, and the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So if you decide to climb up a mountain and you're standing here like so, gravity is still pulling down on you this way, right? But the normal force of the earth is repelling you this way. Those two forces don't cancel out. You might fall, right? So that makes sense why we do have falling. It's because a force is not canceling out. That's why we got acceleration on the incline for our second lab of the year. What is the weight of a two kilogram mass? Fg equals mass times gravity equals two kilograms times, let's use 10 in this chapter, equals 20 newtons, okay? What is the mass of a two kilogram object on the moon? Mass is mass, that doesn't change. No matter where you go in the universe, besides maybe a black hole, then we can say that mass is two kilograms. Relativistic speed, two kilograms doesn't make sense either, but it would for you while you're moving. If you're moving at like, let's say half the speed of gravity, half, yeah, if you're moving at half the speed of light and you were to stand on a bathroom scale that's also moving at half the speed of light, the bathroom scale is gonna read two kil, or well, it won't tell mass. We'll say you have triple beam balance put a two kilogram mass on it, you're all moving in a spaceship at half the speed of light, it's gonna say two kilograms. But for an outside observer that sees you go zooming by, they would mass this at being much, much greater. So mass is something that's relativistic, but that, we're not about relativity. So for us, a mass is two kilograms is two kilograms. How much does that mass weigh on the moon? We'll call it Fg for the moon is equal to mass times gravity on the moon which is 1.67, plug that in your calculator and you get 3.3, all right? So if you ever got to see the astronauts hit a golf ball on the moon, stumble and fall down, uh, I don't know, what can a typical pro golfer hit a golf ball? Like 350 meters, 350 yards, I don't know, I can't stand golf. Uh, on the moon, I think when they hit the golf ball, it probably went 1,000 meters easy, and I'm just making this stuff up. I know that it went a long way it's because, number one, there's no air resistance either. But number two, the big one is, is the fact that there's not much gravity, um, that that ball's going to just keep traveling. Our range increases a lot. All right, Newton's third law. How do you run? Okay. Truth is, when you run, you your legs aren't what make you propel forward. What happens is your legs push on the earth. You spin the earth like a hamster wheel. F of the person acting on the earth. Okay? What makes you run is the fact that the earth pushes back on you with an equal and opposite force. It's always whatever force is acting on the object is what then has to be accounted for with the object. This makes sense because if you were to stand, let's say you got into a sprinter's uh, stance on like a ice skating rink, and then all of a sudden they shot the gun and you went, you're just going to slip and fall because you can't get the traction, right? You're, there's no friction there for you to uh, push off of. Well, when you push off of it, you push the skating rink backward. The skating rink then pushes you forward. So that's the force that makes a person run. And then, of course, we know that there's also at the same time this force acting on the person. And there's also this force acting on the person, but they're not really interaction forces. They just happen to be equal and opposite but they're not interaction forces. The interaction force to the force of gravity is your force of gravity of you pulling up on the earth. The interaction force to the earth holding you up, that electrostatic force is the force of you pushing down a normal, we don't really call it a normal force to push down, but the force of the person pushing down on the earth. Those three forces act on the earth, these three forces act on the person. Two of them, cancel out. Two interaction pairs happen to be equal and opposite to equal and opposite. So they cancel out. We don't care. But one of them is unbalanced. It's the one that's acting only on the person forward. They move forward. How do you jump upward? Okay. So when you want to jump upward, you use your legs and you push downward on the earth. Force of the person pushing on the earth. When you do that, the earth says, oh yeah, it pushes back on you. Force of the earth pushing back on the person. Okay. Now, meanwhile, there's still the force of the earth pulling you down, gravity, and there's still the force of the earth pushing back up on you, normal, okay? 
And then there's also those forces that cancel out with gravity normal of you doing those things to the earth. Let's forget about those, even though this section is about looking at those. So we can't completely forget about them. What if you were standing on a bathroom scale and you jumped up? We'll do this as a as a extra credit, maybe, is film it. See what happens when you jump up. Right as you jump up off of that bathroom scale, it's going to read a whole lot more. I'm going to stand on a bathroom scale today. I'm so depressed because I didn't get to exercise at all this weekend with all this uh, smoke in the air. I'm like 178 pounds. Man, I'm supposed to be around 172 right now. That's really, that's really, really bothering me right now. So I'm very grouchy. Okay, so I stand on my bathroom scale. It says 178, and then all of a sudden I jump up, and all of a sudden, as I'm jumping up, filming this, I'm not gonna let you do it. It's really hard to film it. As I'm jumping up, all of a sudden, it, the bathroom scale shoots up to 300 pounds. What just happened? Turns out the bathroom scales, what they read is normal force. They don't actually read your weight. We think they do because our weight is equal and opposite to the normal force. But really, what the bathroom scale is doing is holding you up. So when you jump upward, you push down on the bathroom scale, the earth has to push back up on you. This scale gets squished more than it normally does. And so really, these two things add together to give you a net force that's greater than this one downward. And that's why we accelerate upward. Okay. Let's say you decide to hit a nail with a hammer uh, into a wall. Okay. How does it work? Okay. So we know that the hammer is going to exert a force on the nail. Force of H on N. You can read that okay? Han. H on N. Okay, equal and opposite to that is the force of the nail on the hammer. If you've spent any time hammering nails, you might notice that after a while your wrist starts kind of hurting because it sometimes has to do with the vibration that occurs. But really, it, that vibration is caused by this force coming back onto the hammer. Right? So we have those two forces. Now, only one of them acts on the nail. So that makes the nail want to move forward. But meanwhile, the nail with a much smaller uh, point, right, at the tip of the nail creates a lot of pressure in that spot. Okay? It's, but it's not that big of a force. The amount of force right there, no, nope, that's not supposed to be in red. It's about that long. This is the force of the, uh, you know what? I shouldn't have said that one first. What I should have said was when you hit the nail with the hammer, the nail hits the wall. But over a much smaller surface area, so force of nail acting on the wall. Much smaller surface area means you don't get much of a force. It's a, a big F over a really small A is transmits into a very large pressure. We don't study pressure in this class, but that's what happens here. Just know that the force is much less. That force of the wall then pushing back on the nail, those two blue ones are the ones that are actually acting on the nail. And notice that they're unbalanced. Whenever you have an unbalanced set of forces, F net equals the force of the, we'll just call it the force of the hammer, minus the force of the wall. If those two things aren't equal and opposite, my friends, you get acceleration. That's what our next section is about. Okay. All right. Chapter five, homework number one, one through 10. Come on. I'm going to be asking questions like, what's the weight of something, right? Easy questions. But there are a couple from the very beginning that take a little bit more time. Newton's second law. I think I have three of these and we're all done. You decide to throw a baseball. 0.142 kilogram baseball leaves the player's hand at 20 meters per second. If the throw lasted 0.02 seconds, determine the magnitude of the force exerted on the ball. All right, so here's what I know. is Somebody exerts a force on the ball. So maybe I'm going to draw that. Yeah, I'll put it right here. This is the force of the ball, uh, the person on the ball. Ah, I don't know what I'm doing. People keep walking by outside, and I'm like, who's that? Who's that? I don't know who anybody is anymore. Of course, everybody's wearing masks, too, so maybe I don't recognize them. Uh, force of the person acting on the ball. All right. Now, that equal and opposite to that is the force of the ball acting on the person. It's like, that's weird. I don't know that I would notice that, right? It's like, we're throw a ball, but it's there. You just don't notice it. Okay, those two are equal and opposite. But because one acts on just the ball, that ball accelerates so that it starts out with an initial speed of zero and then leaves the person's hand with a speed of 20. Okay, it does this over a time of 0.02 seconds. That's all the stuff that's given there. And then they ask us to find out what is the force of the person acting on the ball. 
So if you were doing this for the first time, like you are, there's everything that's given right there. Okay. So now I'm going to change this just a little bit. And instead of calling it F equals question mark, how about F net equals? And then we can really even go so far as to say F net equals the force of the person on the ball. Okay. So now what next? Well, if there is a net force acting on something without forces to cancel out, then we have to put in that the net force equals m times a. If the forces cancel out, we can say that equals zero. We'll have that plenty of times this chapter. Don't worry. If you're still confused, it's, it's all coming. Practice and practice and practice. You'll know when to put what. Okay. But since this is a net force acting on the ball, it's m times a. And then that equals the force that we care about, the force of the person acting on the ball. That's the money question right there. So in order to get the money question, since I don't have any more I can do over here, let's work on this side for a little while. What's the mass of the ball? 0.142. What's the acceleration of the ball? I don't know. But they gave us the motion variables. And I think those motion variables they gave us fit nicely into, let's do it over here, BF equals VI plus AT. Or in other words, 20 equals 0 plus A times 0 0.02 and solve for A. Once you get that A, let's put it in there. And then the force of the person acting on the ball equals 0.142 times that ginormous number. 1,000 meters per second squared. That's like 100 g-forces. Yeah. Well, that's what it came out to be. I, make, I didn't make this stuff up, I don't think. I think the textbook did. But once you take that ginormous acceleration and put it into the F net equation, now 142 newtons doesn't seem that bad. My weight, I know I said 178 pounds. That works out to be like 600 and something newtons. So if my weight is something, let's just make it, let's go big. If my weight 700 newtons, could the amount of force I put on a ball be, you know, one seventh of that or one fifth of that or whatever? Sure. Why not? That seems like a, a legitimate size force that, a, that an arm could put onto something. Okay. Example two. A bullet is fired from a gun with a 24 centimeter barrel. Its muzzle speed is 350 meters per second. Mass of the bullet is this. Compute the average force exerted on the bullet by the expanding gases. In other words, what is the force of the gun acting on the bullet? So in order to figure that out, they gave us motion variables. They didn't tell us this one, but we know the bullet starts out with no speed. Muzzle speed for a gun means how fast the bullet comes out of the gun. And then they gave us, in this case, instead of a time, they gave us a distance, 24 centimeters, 0.24 meters. So if I say that F net equals the force of the gun acting on the bullet, I'll just call it the force of the gun. We know what it's acting on. Then M times A, if I want to know the money question, the force of the gun or the expanding gases, I need to know what A is. So now we go back to motion variables. Bullets mass, 0 0.006 kilograms. It's acceleration. So it looks to me, I know you're all thinking it right now. Bs squared equals Vi squared plus 2As. You mean we still got to do that stuff? Yeah, all the time. It's all for that acceleration. You get something that's like, no way. Two million? That doesn't make any sense. That's over, that's like over six million miles per hour. Or, yeah, I see I should have a squared there. Yeah, let's not do that because we want to leave it in feet per second squared. So let's not even try to adjust this to a, a miles and hours measurement. It just seems way too big. But then when you put it into the equation and solve for the force of the gun, 15,000, I mean, that still seems awfully big, but, you know, we've watched enough things on like ridiculousness and seen where somebody shoots a gun and the gun hits them in the forehead and you kind of go, okay, it makes sense that there must be a pretty good sized force. Remember that a human's weight is somewhere between 500 newtons and 800 newtons. So to say 15,000 newtons be the force of a gun as it recoils backward, I can buy that. That seems like it could be okay, provided all my math was okay. I don't really care if it's not. It's not a big deal. Last one. Uh, I think I have a quiz at the end of this. It's the end of the second half of chapter five. And this first problem here, this example three, kind of reminds me of that quiz. You can actually look at it ahead of time if you want to. It's already posted on the uh, website. But it's a quiz, and you're going to be doing it. Kid pulls a loaded wagon having total mass of 100 kilograms. He applies a constant force of 100 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees. So the kid's pulling this way, okay? 
compute the horizontal force on the wagon and the resulting acceleration. So they were nice because what we know about wagons is if it's heavy, which 100 kilograms, that's pretty heavy, right? That's a thousand pounds or a thousand newtons, which already then that means that that wagon weighs more than a person does. So we know that this kid's probably not going to lift the wagon off the ground. When this wagon is accelerating, it's going to accelerate this way. That's the direction of its acceleration. Therefore, if these are all vector quantities, we need to know the force. Let's use a different color. We need to know the force in that direction. So fortunately, the question actually asks us to do that because we need to know what it is. So F net in the X direction is equal to the force times, okay, so if this is a 30 degree angle, in fact, I think I had this on the next slide, but I've already made all the drawings here. F net it equals a 30 degree angle would be F times cosine, if the reference angle makes us a side adjacent, times cosine of 30. Or in other words, 100 newtons times cosine of 30, which equals 87 newtons. So we now know how much of that force is being applied horizontally and the rest of it is being applied vertically, which would be about 50 newtons. That 50 newtons won't lift that off the ground because it's just too heavy. Okay, so now, uh, once we know the force, could we just say that uh, F net equals F in the X direction, right? So that M times A equals 87, or in other words, 100 kilograms times A equals 87 newtons. So then when we solve for A, we get 87 newtons divided by 100 kilograms. And that comes out to be 0.87 meters per second squared. Meters per second squared, where did that come from? Newtons divided by kilograms gives us meters per second squared? Well, yeah, because I didn't probably explain this well enough. We we're starting to talk about forces here today. And I didn't even mention to you that if the definition of force is mass times acceleration, and this is measured in newtons, this is kilograms times meters over second squared, that this is really another name for a newton. So really a newton down here becomes kilograms times meters over second squared divided by kilograms, cancels those out to leave the meters per second squared behind. Nobody's going to ask you to define that at any time. You just need to know the units of all of your different things. Okay. Chapter five, homework number three, because there is no homework number two, because that was part of a lab which I said I was going to remove, and then I ended up putting the lab in because you're going to have that lab tomorrow, but there's no lab homework with it. So just do the homeworks in the order that you see them on your homework sheet. And that will be number one, followed by number three. Thank you for your attention. You guys have a wonderful rest of your day.